software developers have been socializing in chat rooms for decades. In the 90s, we began using IRC and AOL Instant Messenger. In the early 2000s, we turned to Google Hangouts and Yammer. Today, we are using modern apps like Slack and HipChat. On today's show, we take a deep dive into Gitter, the chat client specifically designed for developers. Our guests are Mike Bartlett and Andrew Newdigate, the creators of Gitter. Gitter is a highly scalable, real-time social application for developers to talk about writing their software. This is a great episode that spans topics like front-end development, back-end distributed systems, how to compete with Slack, how to scale a chat room to tens of thousands of active users. There is so much here. If you're a fan of Software Engineering Daily, we want to know how to improve. Please take five minutes to fill out our listener survey. There is a link to the survey in our newsletter and on our website. We would love to know what you think, what you want to hear more of, and equally important, what you want to hear less of. We read all of the feedback we get, so please fill out the survey and help us build the best software podcast for you. After a quick word from our sponsor, we will get to this episode of Software Engineering Daily. Your company has important projects that need to get done. The iOS app needs to be rewritten for Android. The database needs to be migrated. Your continuous deployment system needs to be built. The website needs a complete redesign. But you don't have enough software engineers and designers to get all this work done. TopTal is here to save you. TopTal gives you exclusive access to the top 3% of freelance talent. Software engineers and designers, from Python to PHP. TopTal has the freelance talent you need to get your projects finished on time with top quality. In the past, we had to worry about flaky freelancers with poor communication skills, unreliable internet connections, subpar technical skills, and so on. TopTal screens for these kinds of things and only works with seasoned professionals with tremendous problem-solving skills, personality, and drive. Here's how it works. TopTal's internal team of senior engineers will work with you to understand your project scope and your talent needs, and they will custom match you with just a few hand-picked candidates. This means that whenever you need to add top-shelf talent for a critical project, you can be connected with pre-screened engineers who are hand-picked for your needs. And the results are impressive. TopTal clients conduct just 1.7 interviews for every hire that they make. All you need is to come ready with some decent technical specifications of your project, and TopTal's team of engineers will take care of you from there. If you are looking to add critical talent fast and you need a source you can trust, go to toptal.com slash se daily. You can also send me an email directly at softwareengineeringdaily at gmail.com and I will personally introduce you to the team at TopTal so that you can learn more. We live in unique times. The nature of work is changing, and more and more industry-leading companies, from Airbnb to JP Morgan, are realizing the benefits of scaling quickly and staying flexible by working with elite freelancers. So if you're short on resources for your projects, check out toptal.com slash sedaily. Thanks to TopTal for sponsoring the show. Now let's get on with this episode. Mike Bartlett and Andrew Newdigate are the creators of Gitter, a chat client for developers. Mike and Andrew, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. It's Thank great you. to be here. So what is Gitter? Gitter is a network for developer communities to come and hang out and to talk about software, basically. Okay. Uh, And so it started out as specifically for GitHub. And if you go to the website, I think it still says like a chat client for GitHub. So has that branding changed? Are you no longer like a specific, do you no longer specifically associate as uh, like related to GitHub? It's specifically still built on top of github you need a github identity to participate but we've um since i guess quite a long time ago allowed people to create personalized sort of rooms or communities that doesn't necessarily need to map directly to a repository when when we first launched 
we created this just dead simple way to take any repository on GitHub, one click, create a, a chat room and start talking with people. And now you can kind of, I guess, tailor your, your channels and what the topics are. And it doesn't have to map directly to a repo. Okay. So this is basically like uh, GitHub is the identity platform with the most developers, perhaps, was the rationale. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So prior to Gitter, what did people like collaborating on GitHub or just programmers in general, what did they use to communicate about open source projects? Well, obviously the number one um, uh, service that people use was IRC and Freenode. And a lot of people still do use that. Um, but obviously with IRC, there's a, you know, you've got to have a client um, and there's a certain amount of um, complexity in setting that up and, and getting involved. And often people just have a quick question um, and they don't have a, they don't have ISC clients, um, and so you know we've taken a lot of that. Um, you know, a lot of people who've just wanted a, a very quick repo that they or a very quick room that they want to set up and and help them with that. Yeah, I think you know, just to elaborate on that, I think IRC is obviously a, a technology born before the age of cloud and before the age of mobile. And you know, as Andrew said, you, you've got to basically be connected with the clients at the time or like effectively the conversation never happened. And so, you know, with, with Gitter, all of the conversation is publicly available. You, you don't even need to sign in to see it. It's stored forever. It's indexed by Google. It's searchable. If you're on mobile, you get push notifications when, when stuff happens. And then on top of that, we built like a whole bunch of developer centric features. So, we thought that when people were talking about code and you pay some code in, well, why doesn't that code look like how the code looks like in my IDE? And so we, you know, syntax highlights and process all of the, all of the, the, the text so people can, can do that kind of stuff where they can embed code snippets or like code okay. pens they can actually embed and they'll execute and people can, can see them. So we, we created a much richer environment, I guess, um, and what we feel is a, is, is a slightly more modern approach to, to messaging. It seems like there was a really, really long time where IRC was still used as the de facto technologist communication tool for programming. And yet it seemed like this strange, antiquated thing, like why are people still using IRC? But it, and yet it was so popular and so prevalent for so long now there's finally like a, a whole rash of technologies that are replacing IRC. Why did it take so long? <laughs> That's a good question. I, you know, I'm I'm not convinced that people were necessarily focused on this problem space. I think if we look at how technology has tended to evolve, that you'll get all these bright shining lights that people will just flock towards and try to create solutions for. And a lot of that was certainly in the, 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 the social space, in, in, the commu in the consumer space, you know, the whole solo mo with social, location, mobile. And that's kind of where all of the best brains in our industry were sort of spending their time trying to figure out how they could yo someone better on a, on a, on a mobile phone. <laughs> and like, no, it was just a, someone, it just takes someone to start thinking about this. And, you know, we started thinking about messaging outside of the consumer space in the, in the business space. And, uh, you, you know, we, we kind of positioned, I guess, in a weird place because we, we don't necessarily feel that we're a consumer product. We're certainly not a, an enterprise product, and um, it was just a, a space that no one had really given much attention to. And now it's obviously seeing a lot of attention. And there's you know many tools that you can use, and in, in some way that's good, but in, in some ways it's bad because there's I guess a bit of fragmentation going on, and maybe you've got like nine messaging apps now on <laughs> that you use every day. But um, say la vie, maybe. Hmm. Say la vie, indeed. Um... So I'd love to get some more of the story, like how you got compelled to start working on Gitter. Cool. Um, I guess we, it was Gitter was almost a was, was effectively a pivot, and we started initially working on another product called Troop, and Troop was effectively a broad purpose com, um, messaging platform for for businesses. 
And I guess the genesis of that was I had spent like seven years at Skype um, before doing this. And I had seen the rise of messaging in the, certainly in the consumer space. And I'd seen a lot of people using Skype for business purposes and the tool was never built for that. And the execution was, um, I guess they're, you know, not, not ideal for, for business specific use cases. Um, and you know, I, I wanted to do this for a while. And so Andrew and I got together and we started building out this, this, this tool called Troop and raised some funding for that. And then pretty much halfway through building that, Slack came out and it was exactly what we were trying to build um, with, with, you know, a bigger team, better funding. Um, and they were, they were ahead of where we were. And so we looked at what we had and we, we, there were a couple of differences with what we did and what Slack did. And one of them was we had a, a single open network. So rather than these kind of silos of teams, anyone could effectively talk to anyone. And secondly is we we had these links that you could just share with anyone and they could click them and they would join and they would be talking. And, you know, we had this sort of vision of what, what we call like one-click chat. And when we looked at those assets, we thought, well, this would work a lot better in something that was more open than team collaboration. And, you know, being software developers ourselves, um, we sort of turned our, our hand to, to looking at community and built, building on top of GitHub gave us a massive advantage in, in helping stimulate that because it was the home of any open source project or the home of all developer communities kind of existed inside GitHub, really. Mm. So Slack is obviously the messaging uh, elephant in the room, but, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the importance, the growing importance of messaging. Uh, the 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 phrase that I really like is there. I, there were you know Benedict Evans from Andreessen Horowitz. I think he says messaging is the medium. So it's more like you know I don't know. How if you want to think about the space uh, in in terms of how expansive it could potentially be, it's just like you know it's a medium. So uh, there's plenty of different ways to slice it. And in terms of like the interesting technological discussions that we could have, especially around comparing Gitter to Slack, I think the notion of having um, completely open rooms uh, brings into some some really interesting scalability discussions. So, like, let me just ask you up front: like, what is? Tell me about a crazy scalability problem that you've had. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, you know, we had uh, Quincy Larson from Free Code Camp on the show, and he was talking about how Slack essentially could not scale to the size of rooms that that they wanted, and so they switched to Getter. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm curious if, if that's actually a really tough scalability problem, I'm guessing it is, or if it was like Slack is built to not be able to scale beyond that, and that's a feature rather than a bug. So we pretty much... A lot of our optimization that we've done around our product has been a result of uh, Quincy and the free code camp rooms. So um, we've had a we've had a lot of problems because of the size of their rooms, um, and we've <laughs> so far we've we've managed to get on top of all of them. Um, so just going back to what Mike said about Troop, when we built Troop, we we never really envisioned a room with more than a hundred people in it. You know, we thought. Uh, we were going for sort of small to medium sized businesses, and we thought a room with 100 people would be enough. And then obviously, we started building Gitter and, you know, ended up with rooms with 20, 30, 40,000 people in them. Um, and so, anywhere in the code where there was sort of a, an N squared uh, complexity problem in the code, when something you'd never notice when there were 100 users in a room, all of a sudden, when you got 40,000 users in a room, that becomes like a serious problem. So, We've had to spend a lot of time profiling our code and finding hotspots that, you know, you don't necessarily find in a test room where you've loaded up 100 test users, um, but you do find when you load 40,000 test users into that room. And so we've done a lot of profiling around that. There's a lot that we've had to do to, to fix that and streamline that and, and uh, run uh, things asynchronously, you know, across multiple servers. Um, so yeah, th those guys have uh, have uh, kept us up quite a lot at night, but we've we've dealt with a lot of it. But, I mean, we, you know, we've changed the way that we even just store data, and you know, yeah. the, the the architecture behind how we store it. I'll, I'll give you an example. Anytime you 
you, you, you open a room like that and you want to list all the members in the room and, you, you know, that was stored in, I guess, a single Mongo document. Um, and every time that people were loading that room and requesting that resource, you were going and putting like hundreds of K, if not yeah, megs yeah. of just, okay, these are the people in, in this room right now out of the query. And so, you know, A, we changed some of the data structure. B, we changed some of the way in which you load that because you probably don't need to know about all of those people up front. And, you know, there's, I guess, a lot of both design decisions and te technology decisions that you need to make in parallel to be able to cater for communities that big. Mm. Okay, so in order to have a more uh, granular discussion about the scalability stuff, could you give me an idea of what the front end and back end looks like? So pretty much um, all the code we write is JavaScript. On the server, we're running Node.js. Um, and then we, we, we share a lot of the code between the client and the server. Um, and the client is, is built on top of Webpack um, and Marinette.js, um, Backbone. And we use uh, Bayou for all our real time. So we started off with a, a client called Fay. Um, and then we ran our own fork of Faye for a very long time, um, and it just got further and further away from the original library. So we've actually moved across to our own open source Bayou library now, which we've published. It's called Halley. Um, and it just it's just kind of more suited to the problems that we were seeing and and sort of what we needed out of a out of a Bayou client. Um, and Bayou is just a protocol that it sort of runs um, like a standard uh, sort of protocol for across the network. So there's clients for Java and, and iOS, and you know that's what we really liked about it. We could we could find a client off the shelf for for a whole lot of different platforms. Um, when you when you say Bayou, are are you referring to the distributed systems algorithm Bayou, or is it a just no? It's a, a comment. Another name for it is Comet D. So it's like a, the name of the Bayou tapestry. <laughs> um, it's basically a um, like a a protocol for doing like eight, uh, long polling and web sockets um, and sending messages between a client and a server. So the uh, Faye is, uh, is kind of the most common or the most popular um, Bayou library out there. Yeah. It's basically like PubSub over, over web sockets. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we have thousands and thousands of people connected simultaneously and we need to distribute messages out to them, whether it's chat messages, whether it's presence updates when people come online. And I get, this is one of the areas where Andrew has spent uh, huge amounts of time and other members of the team as well, just optimizing our real-time stack because on the surface, it's pretty simple to create something that sends a message from a laptop to a server to another laptop. And you can probably go to any uh, small library and get something up and running really quickly. And then you'll high five yourself because you're all, all, of, all of a sudden a real-time developer but there's a lot of issues, A, at scale dealing with that, and B, in real world scenarios. So when someone you know, closes their laptop and opens their laptop, how do you deal with the fact that you know, there's somewhere there's a connection just dangling around and maybe the server thinks it's still open and um, there, there's a lot of like yeah. meat space type engineering to try and make sure that it works as smoothly as possible and people are connected as often as possible without being disconnected. Also dealing with, uh, you know, we use uh, Amazon Web Services and we've got everything running behind ELBs. Um, we found some really nasty WebSocket bugs when running behind ELBs. We reported them to Amazon and they've been amazingly good at fixing them. Um, but just small things like uh, TLS protocol um, strange bugs in TLS protocol uh, through an ELB that was just causing Chrome to, to behave really strangely. Um, and those kind of problems, which you, you know, when you set up something in five minutes, you go like, hey, this works really well. But then after you've been, you know, doing it for a few months, you you pick up on a lot of really strange problems. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's always interesting when the, you know, you, you can push the, the limits of these uh, of these uh, stacks that in ways that they haven't been pushed before. Like if you can push Amazon in ways that you're discovering new bugs, that certainly says something about the uh, level of throughput that you're dealing with. So I'm curious if there are subjective decisions that you have to make. So like you know, for example, if you're trading off between consistency and availability, 
Um, you know, when, you know, if somebody closes their laptop and, you know, you're not sure whether you want to register a message in a certain situation, um, maybe you could give me an idea of, of whether there are subjective decisions for how to, how to deal with these, uh, these scalability and distributed systems problems, or if it's, if it's less subjective, if it's more like you can really come to a consensus easily. Certainly. So uh, one example is um, uh, the way that we store unread items. So obviously every user uh, per, per room that that user is in, we keep track of, of what they've read and what they haven't read. Um, and so what would happen is, is uh, what does happen is if you're in a room with 40,000 people, someone sends a message and that gets distributed to all 40,000 people. And then within the next few minutes, some of those people will have read that message and they'll mark it as read. And so there's this massive sort of uh, churn in the database between unread messages being created and then those messages being marked as read. Um, and you can imagine it's, it's really high transaction levels. If you've, if you've got one room with 40,000 people and then sort of scale that across you know, many thousands of rooms. It's it's a it's a it's a real um, uh, scalability problem. And so, in that case, we've kind of um, uh, elected to go with uh, Redis, and we we keep everything in Redis. So obviously, there we don't have the same sort of persistence that we'll get in a you know full uh, asset database, for example. But we'd never be able to get that sort of scale from an asset database. Um, and so, we keep everything in Redis. We run lots of replicas and we don't persist to disk very often just because we find that we would have to have ridiculously fast SSDs. Um, and touch wood so far, we haven't lost any of those messages uh, because we keep a lot of um, we keep a lot of copies of the data, a lot of repli uh, replicas of the data, and we use uh, Sentinel to be able to switch between Redis instances and, and manage that process. But that's an example of where we've had to go with um, you know, performance over persistence in our in our data. And, and, but then also we make you know, I guess sensible sensible decisions where if the use if someone's got more than a hundred unread messages, we'll just stop tracking them and say, right, like you've got a lot to catch up on, and we won't keep track on them yeah. on, a, on an we'll, individual level, and that's the threshold. And that you know, it seems reasonable from a usability perspective, and it kind of alleviates some pressure on the, the infrastructure because you're not having to track as many across the whole network. How do you decide how often to snapshot your messages for replication? Uh, uh, from the, uh, what, between the servers or between the client and the servers or? Uh, I, what, whichever is interesting. So, I mean, with, the, uh, with Bayou, with Faye on the server, um, people will basically either do web sockets or, or long polling. Uh, and when they're using long polling, there'll be uh, about 500 milliseconds that we'll wait for messages to queue up before we send them to the client. Um, and when we're using, um, I, I don't even know if it's that long. It might be, it might be 300. Um, and then on when when they're connected through a web socket, we're obviously streaming those um, uh, the messages uh, instantaneously. So as soon as as soon as there's a message for the client, we send it through to them. And that's really just a matter of tuning and spending a lot of time, you know, testing, seeing, you know, uh, what the best performance versus, uh, you know, server-side performance, you know, client-side perceived performance versus server-side performance is. Um, but obviously the, the sort of primary goal is to have everyone running on web sockets, but there's always going to be a certain number of people who have got bad connections or, or really dodgy enterprise proxies that are yeah. messing with uh, with web sockets. So, you know, they're the ones who are doing the long polling. Um, I think we've got, you know, a huge amount of, I guess, parameters by which we can configure some of these, um, you know, like the back offs and the reconnects and all of these things. And as Andrew said, it's been, I guess, a bit of trial and error where we'll fine tune them. And one of the things that we do quite heavily is we instrument the application in quite a detailed way. So all of the data in terms of like timings and who's connected and, you know, how the, the servers are performing and everything is all getting sent back um, via StatsD to Datadog. And we've got these pretty big dashboards and well, like lots of dashboards in Datadog and we can 
you know, test them out. We can test parameters on a subset of users and have a look at how they're performing and, you know, really be quite data centric about how we do these types of things. And, you know, we can see very visibly when you make a, a change, how it actually will trickle down right the way through the system. I, I'll give you one, one example, and it's, it's actually less of a parameter one, but recently we made quite, we did quite a switch over between um, uh, how we do promises inside inside JavaScript from Q to Bluebird, and on the subset of users or on the subset of server infrastructure that we tested it out on, we kind of immediately saw memory usage on the memory pressure on the application dropping by like over 50%, a fifty yeah, yeah. percent to a third, and then it's you know immediately we know okay right this is a good thing and we need to continue to do this in the code. We need to continue to deploy this out to other people. So we're very, very data centric on how we make technology decisions and even product decisions as well. Engineers love automation and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. You wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily, and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing. Get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. I want to talk some about the clients that you've built. So, um, you know, people might look at Gitter and say, well, first of all, you guys have an Android and iOS client, right? Yep. So people might look at Gitter and they'd be like, okay, these guys have built a desktop app, an Android app, an iOS app. It works in the browser. How are they doing all this? They say they do it all in JavaScript. How do you convert JavaScript to, uh, to these different platforms? So the the Android and the iOS apps are both hybrid. So they use the uh, the main chat view is is web based, um, and we ship um, basically some JavaScript that, that runs inside the inside a web view. Um, but the left menu, for example, is is native, and a lot of the the other services are native. But the chat view itself is is the web is uh, is JavaScript. Um, and we actually that actually comes out of our main code base, the same code base that gets used to compile the um, the web clients, and we just use a different you know set of parameters and a different webpack uh, configuration to basically build that. And then whenever we ship a new uh, JavaScript or a new iOS or Android release, we build a new version of that, and that allows us to to kind of manage all these different clients at the same time. I mean, we also have a, an IRC client. There's the API, you know, uh, the API. There's um, the Fay API as well, which is public, um, and we have two different desktop clients. That so we have a lot of we have a very wide surface area, um, and most of that was built when there were four of us in the team. Um, so it was really important for us to be able to leverage a small code base and deploy it to lots of different places. Um, and Webpack has, has been really fantastic with that. We also used, before Webpack, we used Require.js, but really uh, once we got, once we switched over to, to Webpack, things became a lot easier. Um, you know, and so we, we have a single code base that, that basically gets compiled into different bundles for different environments. Um, that really helps us move quite quickly. When you have a chat app running in a web view, does it feel like a highly responsive, like fantastic experience that you would expect from a fully native app? So, so when we started building, like especially when we started building the Troop um, iOS app many years ago, like three years ago, it really felt pretty slow on a <laughs> on an iPhone 3s. 
Um, and we did a lot to optimize around that. And we, we really um, chopped out a lot, of, a lot of features just to kind of improve the speed. Um, but recently we upgraded to the, uh, on iOS 8, we upgraded to WK WebView, which is the new iOS um, sort of net, uh, web view. Um, and that does JIT compiling. So that's the first time that you've been able to use JIT compiling inside um, a custom application with the web view. And the, the speed difference is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it's enabled us to get rid of uh, the last remains of uh, Cordoba and, and those kind of products because it's really easy to talk between the, the web view and the, and the native code now. Um, so that's, that's really made a huge difference. And I think now, especially with WK web view, things are starting to feel pretty snappy. And Moore's Law. Yeah, and Moore's Law, exactly. <laughs> and Moore's Law. WK WebView on an iPhone 4S still feels pretty slow. Uh, but luckily, we don't have too many users on uh, iPhone 4Ss anymore. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm, I'm, I always try and – I mean, it's, it's a great question because, you know, we largely did it purely from a – we were resource constrained, right? There were four people and, um, you know, we, we couldn't have, like, two Android developers, two iOS developers building all of this stuff and um, – I'm, I'm always trying to figure out if, if, if I would do it again. And certainly if you're constrained in a small team and you're building something that has to be web, iOS, Android, potentially desktop, then I think it's still certainly a very good idea to do it. If you're just building something that's, that's mobile first, then maybe you want to go full native if it's a very much mobile first. But we're, we're very much a desktop first application, right? We help people like talk about code and share code better. And, you know, that's much more appropriate on, on the desktop. And we see, you know, a much smaller m amount of use on mobile. And maybe we're a little bit unique in that um, to, uh, I guess, you know, more consumer tech, perhaps. Well, even in the sense of being resource constrained at four people, I mean, Facebook has been developing React Native essentially because they are doing the work in three places, like over and over and over and over again, they find themselves, uh, you know, split up into uh, Android, iOS and web teams. And they're not resource constrained, certainly, but, uh, you know, working in these terrible silos creates tons of problems. Um, so, I mean, with that in mind, like, have you have you considered React Native? Have you looked at that much? Yeah, we, we certainly have. And, you know, one of the things with React Native is that if, if you want to still, you know, build any kind of custom components, you still need to be building um, in Objective-C Objective or, Objective or Swift and, mm -hmm. and equally in, in Java. And so, uh, you know, if you just if you use the off the shelf Apple components, fine. Or if you're just controlling some kind of application logic um, that's fine, but I, I think if you if you're wanting to build something that's of exceptional kind of user interface quality, you're still going to need to go and you know invest in in na in native code. Um, but certainly, I can imagine from for for face for even so, for someone at Facebook scale that there's a lot of common code that's kind of application logic that's not necessarily in the UI layer. That using something like React Native would be uh, a very good idea to use. There's a tweet from the Gitter uh, account on Twitter, and it says that the native apps for tablet and mobile are not full native, as we've discussed. And it also says, quote, never go full native. And I found this really interesting because I was like, wow, literally never? That's like, that's a strong statement. Was that, was that like a, was that hyperbole or like no, you, I think that was a uh, just a Tropic Thunder reference joke uh, more than anything else. We one oh. of the things we try to do within our company is you know just stay slightly humorous at times and don't take yourselves overly seriously at all times. I think life's a bit too short for that. So that's that's really where that was from. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, I think there's actually a, a huge amount of times. I, I wrote that tweet by the way, um, but I think there are a huge amount of times where you know, going full native and creating a, a beautiful, fast, incredibly responsive experience is worth it for, for a company like ourselves. Um, I think we've got a lot of value out of going the hybrid approach. 
Tell me about building search on a product like Gitter. So we use um, Elasticsearch. Um, and at the moment, we are stuck on Elasticsearch 1.x um, because we use um, a technology called a River plugin, which has been deprecated and has been removed from Elasticsearch 2. Um, and basically what that does is it uh, runs inside Elasticsearch and connects to Mongo, which is our main backend, and basically streams data out of Mongo, transforms it, and puts it into Elasticsearch. Um, and so that's the technology that we're looking to get rid of pretty soon so we can upgrade to Elasticsearch 2. Um, but we, we're really happy with, um, with Elasticsearch. Uh, we've got like a whole bunch of different analyzers for different languages. Um, of, you know, we've got all a whole bunch of Asian languages and Cyrillic languages and some Western languages as well. Um, so we try to sort of parse chats in the in the native language that they were sent in. So we, we do some language recognition um, and try to figure out whether the person was speaking Russian or Chinese or English. And then when we put it into Elasticsearch, we're able to actually search using the native language that that chat was sent in. Um, we Our search at the moment is, is not across the whole site. It's only when you're in a particular room. And that's obviously something we'd really like to, to to, to improve on, and we've got a lot of big plans around that. But yeah, I mean, also to be brutally honest, like I don't think we've invested enough in search, and mm. I, I think our search can certainly, I, I think it's like V1 search right yeah. now, and it's, again, going back to the WebSocket analogy is you can build something pretty good pretty quickly with Elastic, and if you really want to get brilliant at search, like we're brilliant at WebSockets, you've got to invest a lot more time. Um, and that's certainly something that we want to do. And towards the back half of this year, we'll really look to start improving search as we, we're going to be coming out with, with, with another capability in a, in a few months that will um, add additional types of ways of communicating on, on Gitter and in particular in creating more kind of stored content. Because one of the things that, search, that the chat's not great at is search in general, right? There's, you know, there's no sort of question and answer. You might find the answer to something in and amongst a whole picture of a whole like pictures of cats, right? <laughs> and um, so we're trying to solve that in, in, in interesting ways ourselves. And it'll, what we're doing will make search a lot more important. And so it's something that we really hope to improve on ourselves and to actually dedicate some more resource to, because it, it, it is also a specialist type of subject, right? It's not something that you can build the world's best search by like spending a few days with Elastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, even Slack, like Slack has great search, but it still has its warts. Uh, I think search is just such an interesting, hard problem and like search, Search in a chat room is not a very well defined, well explored problem. So, like best practices are not necessarily intuitive. What users want is not intuitive quite yet. Um, we're still early. Um, I'd love to talk about integrations because uh, you know Gitter has lots of integrations with things like Trello and Heroku and Jenkins and Bitbucket. What are the challenges around having all these integrations well, well one of the early decisions we made with the integrations was to completely open source that part of the application and so anyone can basically take our services sdk um, on github fork it build a new integration with something send us a pull request and we'll put it back into the system and everyone benefits from from that work which is we think quite cool. Um, so we've, I guess, not spent a huge amount of time ourselves building all of these integrations. And so that was, again, if you go back to our, our level of resource, I guess quite a good decision to, to, to do it that way. And we've, we've left it up to the community and with the API as well, people are able to integrate in, in, uh, in other interesting ways like i mean people have literally built we don't have a, a windows phone app ourselves um and someone else has built a windows phone app using our apis and it's not somewhere where we have to go 
So in, in that case, the challenge is actually more around ecosystem, making sure your documentation is great, making sure your APIs are great and consistent. And again, it's, it's another area where I think we, to be brutally honest with ourselves, we, we need to get a bit better at because I think we've got, there are quite a few ways that you can do things with the application and maybe we haven't published enough sort of best practices or created enough content to help people build integrations in great ways. Can you tell me some about building an effective API that developers want to use where they are actually compelled to write their own integrations because the API just makes it so easy? Well, the, the API that we publish is, is is the API that we use ourselves. So, so with you know, there's one or two um, small endpoints that are that are private, but pretty much the Gitter web client uses the same API as as the one that we publish. And as Mike said, probably its biggest uh, failing is is actually in documentation and and examples and best practices. Um, and I, in that respect, I think we could do a lot to improve. Um, but Having said that, people have built amazing things with it. There's a lot of different bots. There's, um, you know, people building clients for different platforms um, and lots of really interesting projects that people have done with it. I I think the most important thing behind it is even to think about developers in the way that, like, product people think about consumers, and it's that first-time experience Mm -hmm. of your API needs to be ridiculously simple where, you know, for example, on, on Gitter, you log in and we'll give you all of the like example code will have a curl link that you can basically, or even just an HTTP um, kind of link that you can copy and paste, put it into your browser and you get results immediately. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've worked at, at, at companies before and even, you know, Skype back in the early days where to get up and running on the, on the API was this, massive documentation and you have to get this and install that and go and generate this and that. And like, if you can get a developer pulling data out of your system immediately in like one or two clicks, you know, they're, they're, you've got their attention and they won't go and look somewhere else for something easier. And mm. so I think that's like a number one, really important. And then number two is, as, as Andrew said, just like making sure your documentation and your examples and that that kind of stuff is really easy and you know even like small stuff like here and we we don't do this at all today and i uh, it like annoys me that we don't which is like here's all of our logo stuff that you can use and if you want to build an app and like bang there's the svg of our logo where if i look at it now we you know people have gone google image search and they find like these low res fuzzy versions or like three versions of our logo go where (laughs) b is slightly different and you you know i i think making sure that you like treat developers as like first class citizens and make stuff easy for them as much as possible is really important. Also, we've we've sort of been hurt by that as well. Like um, one of our APIs for fe- for fetching historical messages, there's sort of a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Um, and the right way to do it is say like, okay, I've, I've got the last hundred messages. Now give me the messages, the next hundred messages before this ID. Yeah. Um, and that's just the way that we'd like people to use it. The wrong way to do it is to say, give me a hundred messages. Um, okay. Now skip a hundred messages and give me the, the next hundred. Now skip 300 <laughs> messages, skip 300 messages. And that'll work fine up to like 10,000. But then if you start saying, uh, give me like a million messages from this, well, give me the next hundred messages, skipping the first million that will absolutely kill our MongoDB servers. But if you're just a, if you're just a client, you know, if you're just using the API, you don't have any idea that that's going to kill our servers. And so we've had cases where we'll just see CPU steadily going up and up and up over the day, and we'll start investigating. We'll find that someone's written this client that's just going back and fetching more and more. And that's not their fault. It's our fault for not saying, please don't use that. And in fact, now we, we, we have a maximum number that you can skip before you need to start using the other API. But, you know, that was our own fault because we didn't make it clear to people that, that this API is uh, suboptimal. So historically, you know, through the 90s and the 2000s, when people heard the word integration, I think 
it just filled the, the entire room with dread. Like if you think about integrations back in the day, it just sounds terrible. But now, you know, integrations are everywhere and they're almost expected. You know, if my mail client would wouldn't be able to integrate with Dropbox, I would never use it. Um, so integrations have become the norm, and this is like just increasing. How did this happen? Why, uh, maybe on the on the other end, you know, maybe not on obviously on Gitter's end, what makes it easy is the is the you know exposing the API. What makes it so easy um, in terms of the entire ecosystem? No more soap. <laughs> What'd you say? And no more soap. Well, you know, when yeah. I think back to the early night or early noughties, or late nineties, you know, everyone was like, well, you know, we're going to have this, um, Wisdom file and you can generate a client and it, everything was very heavyweight and, and, you know, people would like sort of publish their APIs as, as these big UML documents. And I think the, the number one change has really been, like the simplification and, and how lightweight so many APIs are now. You know, it's 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 JSON over HTTPS um, and yes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes. and you know the, it's all RESTful. You know, it's a really nice, straightforward, simple URLs so that people can understand and and grasp rather than like you know SOAP endpoints that are completely confusing um, and you generate these horrible clients in Java that are really difficult to use. Um, and I think just having like those lightweight APIs has made such a big difference. Like, you know, these days, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at integrating with the, with the product and the, the, the APIs are so simple and so easy to use, um, where 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, and you had all these really nasty APIs with different XML namespaces. And, uh, I think that's made a huge difference. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, you know, I'm, I'm really curious about focus because uh, you guys are working on a lot of things at once in this product, and there's a lot to keep in your head. How do you identify what needs to be focused on? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I think uh, there's what I think there's an easy trap there are many traps that you can fall into quite easily one is just playing this kind of listen to all of the feedback and fix that and you know keep going and that's that is superbly important but i think equally uh, internally you've got a whole bunch of stuff that you need to do just around internal code quality and making sure that all of your servers are operating nicely and then also you might have these much larger sort of strategic um, kind of capabilities that you want to build into the application or, you know, answering the question differently when all of your users are asking for faster horses and actually, you know, you, you, you're kind of working on this car in the background. Um, what we try and do is, and, and it's really difficult, is balance is balance these things in, in around, you know, different so we, I, we've got, I guess we, we, we look at AQ for quality. So I get this, what I call the sort of five dimensions of a balanced roadmap. And like one is quality. And I, I like to list that one first, because if you don't have quality from the beginning, you're going to run into problems. Um, and then, you know, secondly is delight. So making sure that you're always putting stuff into the product that delights the users, whether it be, uh, something that they requested themselves or, hey, your loading animation is just really cool, like making sure you're doing all that kind of stuff. And then I guess you have the more internal side, which is strategic initiatives um, and then growth initiatives and then engagement initiatives. And if you can almost imagine visualizing and try to measure, for example, you can tag your bugs in GitHub with these things, tag issues in, in, in GitHub. And imagine if you do like a little bit of analysis on your GitHub issues and you're making sure that, okay, well, when we closed last month, we closed a hundred issues or tickets or whatever you want to call them. Are they balanced across those kind of things? Or have we actually been spending all of this massive time over here just doing delight and guess what? Quality is starting to slide. And I think it's, a little bit sometimes you get into this trap where in you know, I, like to, I often like to use the uh, football or, or soccer analogy where if you watch a whole bunch of 
uh, sort of six-year-olds playing football from an overhead view. There's the ball, and there's like 22 kids chasing the ball everywhere, right? And sometimes you can almost get into that um, kind of mode of working where you're always chasing the the issue du jour and try to get into this world where, okay, we try and balance this over a quarter or over a month where, you know, you start to look like a little bit more like a professional football team where there's structure going throughout the pitch. Um, and, you know, that just comes from making sure that every every sprint or every couple of weeks you're just reviewing what you've done, making sure you know what's happening coming forward and making sure you're not getting pulled in all the directions. And then the other tough thing about it is just saying no to a lot. I mean, we must have you know, hundreds and hundreds of feature requests that I think are all completely sensible feature requests. Um, and if we had infinite resource and we didn't compromise on the design of the product, I'd love to do them all, but we, we just can't. We need to focus on the ones that give us the best return. How fast is Gitter growing? Um, as a company <laughs> or like from a metrics perspective or um, I... I mean, last year... Or whatever, whatever you can speak about. Yeah, sure. Uh, last year, we, we're now like 300,000 people on on Gitter. And last year, at the start of last year, we were 50,000 people on Gitter. So we did, you know, a good, I guess, um, 6x on, on you know, the number of people on the network and, and message volume. And then if you look at how that trickles down into, you know, even server-wise, I think we were probably operating five or six production servers at the start of last year. And now we've got like 20, 25, 25 30 yeah. um, server instances across multiple um, uh, availability zones. And then internally as a team, I guess we've du just more than doubled in size. There were four of us at the start of last year. There are nine of us now. Um, so I guess if you look at, you know, we, if we double the team and we increased our other metrics by like five or six times, uh, maybe we're doing something right. Do, do you think you are like, maybe this is sound, that sounds like a dumb question, but do you think you can, is there a point where you get past the scalability problems and you just say, okay, we've, we've gotten to the point and there's no difference between 300,000 users and 1.5 million users and the scalability problems are all solved from there or are there is it just like a linear and there's scalability problems along the entire way I, th I think that there's certain points that you have to big hurdles that you need to get over so uh, we've we've kind of been tackling one of them at the moment which is how do we kind of get our web sockets infrastructure and our real-time infrastructure to sort of scale infinitely um, and we've we've kind of been looking at ways to do that and, and we've actually come up with a nice a nice solution to that problem. And then once we're over that, the next big one will be scaling our Mongo. And then I think after we've done those two, um, everything will be I, I, I can't imagine what the next one is. I, there will be another one, but certainly those two are, are big big hurdles that you need to get over. Another one was like the free code camp, fifty thousand people in a room um, issue. But you know the technologies that we use really help us a lot with that. Like we use Redis uh, and Redis cluster uh, is something we're going to move towards. Um, and and MongoDB has kind of as we've needed new things from the product, they've luckily added new features that have really helped us a lot. Um, but yeah, I think I think hopefully once we've got um, once we're able to scale like the number of connected people on WebSockets sort of infinitely, um, then that'll be a, a, a big step towards just being able to auto scale everything on 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 Amazon, yeah. which is another big project that we're doing at the moment. It's just moving everything into auto scaling groups. So it, it's probably at each kind of order of magnitude, yeah. there's going to be an inflection point where you're going to have to change the architecture of something considerably in order to take it to the next one. And obviously, the later on that that happens and those orders get, get larger and maybe the technology problems become more complex, but mm. equally, you're going to have a little bit more time and also track record and experience of, of solving these problems. So, for, for example, even with our, our, our future vision of scaling WebSockets, 
there is still mm -hmm. a kind of like single point of failure in that in some ways. And then, but, but, but the pressure on that's going to be alleviated for a long time. And then maybe in two or three years, you're going to have to return to it and do something slightly different based on how you're seeing people using the product. Mm. So there was this open letter to GitHub recently that outlined this list of desired features, and um, the letter was signed by a bunch of major contributors to the open source community, uh, and then GitHub responded with an open apology and a promise to fix things that are on the way. Um, <clears throat> so I I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on the situation that you're willing to share, and how that impacts your thinking about a product that is spiritually somewhat similar to GitHub? That's, that's a great question. I mean, I think we, we've, we've had a good relationship with GitHub like from the beginning and, you know, we've, we, we never wanted to make sure that we, that we were stepping on their toes, their toes. And I've seen this in, you know, previous lives where, it, it often happens that consumers of APIs get swallowed up by the producer of the API because that's an area of business that they that they wanted to go in, um, and so we made sure that we that we, we established a good relationship with them early on, and I think they 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 certainly get it and they understand it, and um, you know I think they went through a period where they were very focused on. The, the enterprise side of their business, which we've seen from their from their product offerings, and when the community talks loudly, um, they were quick to pretty much say, "Right, we're aware of this, and we'll, we'll figure this out." And we think we can. What we do brings a lot of value to the whole of the GitHub ecosystem, and we're we're very focused on the community aspects of that. And because GitHub have amazing APIs and, you know, an, an incredible base product with an incredible community and wealth of content and open source stuff with it, we feel that we can just help make that community message a lot better and, you know, continue to work with them to be able to do so. And I'm really excited that um, they sort of recognize this and, um, you know, I, I don't know what their roadmap looks like, and so I don't know exactly what they're going to do to fix it. But you know, we we know it's something that 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 they feel, and it's where they came from in the first place. And it, I'm sure it's going to be something that they'll continue to invest in. Um, so the the elephant in the room that we haven't discussed too much is kind of a comparison to Slack, I think. So I'd love to get a. Um, I know we, we touched on this earlier, but how do you see Gitter relative to Slack, both in the present and evolving into the future? Sure. I, I think, you know, for me, the fundamental difference with us and Slack is what, what, we were, what the purpose of the product exists for. And sure, people use us for private messaging, like in a competitive way to Slack, but it's not what we're built for. It's not what we're best at. And people use Slack for community and, you know, with something like Slack in, but it's, again, it's, it, it, you know, moderation capabilities don't really exist in that kind of environment. It was built in an environment where, you know, everyone in the, in the, in the team is part of the company and you just kind of, you know, that's very different from, okay, well, so-and-so has just left the company, so go to IT and, like, remove him from the room where when you've got a community that's 24-7 and the IT guy is sleeping, you know, how can you control those types of behaviors or get people to, like, report abuse? And so I think we will see a lot more of our roadmap coming out being much more focused on how communities work versus how teams work. So, for you know, integrations, for example, we're not spending a massive amount of time improving that because they're not necessarily heavily utilized by communities. The community is more about the people and it's more about the content and the discussions and less about what you can plug it into. Um, so, like, philosophically, that's where it's going. We, you know, we do things like just discovery and we help people okay, you participate in this kind of community. Here are five or six other communities that you didn't even know existed that might be interesting for, for you to 
um, to work in. And so we've got a directory that you can browse and you can search and we suggest rooms to people. And, you know, like 15% of people joining communities come via discovery. And that doesn't, you know, even exist in, in a Slack world. And quite frankly, it probably shouldn't. Their business is to focus on building an amazing team communication product and discovering um, discoverability of another community is probably not really appropriate for making a better team communication product. So there's certainly on the surface and the way that like most chat products look alike and um, kind of feel the same, like there are philosophical, philosophical differences that we feel um, around community and around openness that make our product more appropriate for that. And I think the fact that you can use Slack for this and yet every week we sign up more users than we did the week before and that continues to grow is just evidence that we're doing something right and Slack's probably even helping just create the awareness of, hey, you can talk, you can chat in different ways and then people are coming to us because they understand that Gitter was built for communities first. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so how much of the growth of Gitter and I guess chat applications in general, how much of this is due to the increasing desire of development teams to work in a distributed fashion? Yeah, I mean, massive, I yeah. think. Because I, I guess there's, there's two sides to this. So one in the private team kind of Slack space, absolutely, and our team is distributed we have what nine people in like six different countries or something like that um and so i think that's definitely affecting how teams work what that also means is i think it starts to affect how communities work as well because previously the thing's pretty simple you had all of your community in london or san francisco and you could have your meetups and you you would service like 80 90 percent of the community in that way and so now we're seeing startup hubs happening all over Europe, all over the world. And we're involved in like startup hubs in, in, in Africa and schools in Africa who are using like Gitter for, for their communities. And, you know, all of a sudden you actually need to empower those communities and give them tools to not only talk amongst themselves, but then connect with the global community as well. And, you know, that's one of the advantages with, with having an open network like us where, anyone can effectively talk to anyone, um, you, you know, you, you're, getting, you're getting benefit out of that. But, you know, I think certainly we, we built a, a, a business where we wanted people to be able to work from, from anywhere. And obviously GitHub is famous for it. And, um, you know, the, like the list is probably endless of, of, of companies. Um, I think Buffer are also pretty famous for doing this as well. And, like this is this is how we can work. This is mm. for, for, for me the future, especially as our kind of work lives have encroached into our personal lives ever since you know the BlackBerry came out basically, and you could start getting your work emails at the dinner table. And you know now I kind of often joke that you'll basically take a conference call at home and you'll do your shopping online from the office and get it delivered there. And the roles are completely reversed between the workplace and between home. And as long as technology can empower this, then people can kind of push back a little bit, spend time, spend more time with their family, not have to have massive long commutes. You know, one of our our guys in in, in Italy wanted to move back closer to his, his family in Italy, just had a, a baby on the way. And with the company he was working for, they didn't have that policy where he could work remotely. And now he can work remotely for us and, you know, still have, I guess, a, a great job and uh, be involved in good technology, but live in, in rural Tuscany, which I think is awesome. Does it have to do, I mean, I think I find it so interesting because the, um, I know Sam Altman, the Y Combinator president is, he's been pretty outspoken about kind of being anti uh, distributed teams, and it seems so strange to me. Um, but my guess is that his his position is going to change in the near future because it just seems to be there's something in the air, and people are moving towards increasingly distributed teams. Is is it about 
the the newer technology tools, the improved technology tools like Gitter and Slack, do they impose more accountability or more measurability or um, what is it about the, the newer technologies that make working in distributed teams easier? Well, I think, you know, one thing technology does is, is it kind of, it, it's, it's the, the, the solution to distance, right? And the fact that, you know, we're mm. sitting here, I mean, it pretty much looks like you're in the room with us over Skype, right? And, you know, in the past, even if you go back to, you know, if we, if we were going to send a letter to each other, that might have taken three months, and that's no way to to collaborate. Although a lot of scientific discovery did happen over <laughs> over, over, over the letters and at the, and the Atlantic, but it doesn't happen in this at the speed of now, right? Yeah. Which is like the world that we live in, where it's just the speed of yesterday, and this has to be done now, and and so I think that it's it's less about like maybe accountability and responsibility, and it's about you know the number one thing that helps any team succeed whether you put them in the same room or whether you put them at the opposite ends of the earth is communication right mm-hmm. like there's there's nothing more effective for a team to build great products than than effective communication and if you've got these multiple modes of communication where like it's email or where it's video calling or whether it's messaging or whether it's like a Trello board that's real time or whether it's screen sharing or InVision or like all of these amazing tools have helped make the distance parts of remote working pretty irrelevant and made it real time and made it collaborative so that we can basically continue to have effective communication. And for me, that's, that's what it's about. It's about the communication aspect more than anything else. Also, I think having like a really driven bunch of people working for you who, who really want to do amazing things and are excited about what they're doing and they sort of get up in the morning and go like, cool, today I'm going to be coding Gitter. Um, I think that really, really helps people yeah. that you don't need to manage. Like if, if we had a team of people that you really had to kind of ask every five minutes, hey, what you doing? And they're like, oh, I've been blocked all morning on. The <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we have got a really great team and everyone in the team is like, you know, most of the time, like, hey, I'm blocked. I need this. Like, yeah. you know, and people are in the Gitter channel kind of going like, hey, why haven't you moved on this? Um, and I think having a team that's driven makes a huge difference to remote working. Sort of if I go back to when I was working in finance before where people are kind of just there, well, not everyone, but some people are there kind of job for life. I think remote working would be much harder to get right because I, I know like when, when people work from home, everyone would admit they would be doing it around the pool, you know, with the <laughs> beer at their side. And I, I don't think that happens with our team. I might be wrong, but like everyone's delivering great stuff. So, you know, I don't even care if they yeah. do. But you're right. It's like but certainly trust and making sure that the team will buy in to what you're doing. I think there was a great example when Marissa Meyer joined, joined um, Yahoo and she basically said, well, no one can work from home anymore. And all of these sort of liberal tech folk like ourselves, were like, oh, that's crazy. This is not the way of the future. But, you know, maybe there were people who had been working there for a long time and Yahoo had been under, under I guess, a lot of pressure. And maybe they didn't feel that engaged with, with the company. And probably having those types of people working from home is not a great use of resource. And mm. um, I think that's a good point you raised, Andrew, is making sure that, you know, people really buy into what they do. Otherwise, they, they, they shouldn't be working there in the first place, really. Yeah. So when I think about socialization on the Internet, I I see these kind of like two big paradigms. So right now there's like chat and then there's also the format of like the news feed that you see on LinkedIn or Facebook or Quora or whatever. Uh, And I'm curious if you guys see these two types of platforms converging. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So we're kind of laughing a little bit because we've spent a a lot of time thinking about how we can add more structure to chat. And that comes, you know, from something that's more, Quora, Stack Overflow-esque, and we've been like testing out a prototype around this since uh, 
just <laughs> maybe like six or eight months ago. And there's, you know, I don't, I guess we don't want to show our hand too much, but there's <laughs> something that we're going to be building quite soon that will kind of do this. And we, we've been thinking a lot about it and, you like this goes back to what we were saying earlier about there's some stuff that Chad is not really good at, and one of those things is sort of structure and focus, and um, that that email is sometimes actually really good at, even though we all bash email all the time. It's like here's the subject, and this is the thing, and I can forward it to thread. this person, and this is the thread if you like, and Core is good at it, and Stack Overflow is good at it, and we've been looking at ways to chatify or real timeify those things and bring them together. So like, absolutely. Yes. We see that happening because we're going to be doing it. Well, well, we're trying, trying to do it, but um, hopefully it will be well received. I think that's, I don't know. I I think it's what's going to happen. It seems like, I mean, why wouldn't it happen? You know, everything seems to be getting increasingly real time. And uh, okay. Well, that's, I think that's a good place to close off. I want to let you guys get back to your work uh, building an actual product rather than me just reporting on stuff. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I am a big fan of Gitter. I think it's an awesome product and um, I look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. Great, Jeff. Thanks. It's been great talking. Thanks so much, Jeff. 